Good morning, everyone. Um, as you can see, we're going to do it as a bit of a double act, but um, I think we can follow neatly on from Chris there and uh, discuss some of the work we're doing in the borders, or should I say... Southern Scotland. Yeah, no. Um, so others have been doing in the borders before we move it on to um, the whole of Southern Scotland. But just to give you a brief introduction what, what Adopt a Monument is. So Adopt a Monument is a... Um, community-led stewardship project. So basically it's interested in conserving places that are important to the people of Scotland. And local societies, community groups, development trusts, etc. come to us with an idea and we help support that project to fruition. So it includes things like, as I say, conservation work, uh, vegetation management, interpretation, researching the site, um, etc. So um, we've been working for the last five years on this project, but it does have a deep history. It's been running um, since the early 90s, and one of the early projects only really stopped working um, officially a couple of years ago, so that, that project ran for 20 years. Um, so we do have a bit of uh, background, and we do have a broad range of uh, sites. So we'll try and focus on the south today, as we say. But again, we currently working with four to seven groups across Scotland. Most of our projects are in the, north, in the Highlands or the uh, West. Um, and we also do what we call outreach projects, which Cara is going to tell you about a couple of those today, where we work with new audiences, whether they're vulnerable um, women's groups or the homeless groups, where we, our employability, so young people can help them um, use archaeology and heritage as a way of improving people's life or uh, engagement activity. Um, there's been two and a half <laughs> slash three of us <laughs> working on a project, two of us are here today obviously. Um, and you can see there what we help with, so we help with fundraising, we help with project planning, um, permissions, um, etc. But before the current phase started, there were a number of projects running from 2006 up until about 2008-2009, and one of which includes the line Kirkyard. And I know Maureen and Trevor are both here. Um, and this was a great project where they conserved one of the uh, very stones in the borders, um, the Adam and Eve stone in the Kirkyard there. Um, it's enclosed in the case, um, there's interpretation boards up, and the site is still in a brilliant condition. Um, and that would kind of set the scene about where we were, what we could achieve, where we could go, um, and what we might want to do in the future. So but Let Line was one of the most important sites, I think, for the that phase of work between 2006 onwards, because it allow, allowed us to see what we could actually achieve in a short amount of time, and what the groups, the community groups, this in this case the people's art, people show archaeological society, were interested in. Which moves us on to the next project we worked with, the people show archaeological society, which is the Hare Brink Cairn. This is a, a cairn that was excavated ahead of forestry plantation but was never um, descheduled and it was never actually planted across. So it survived in the woodland as a kind of an oddity. Um, there are Bronze Age settlements nearby, it's off right on the edge of an old coach road. But it had become overgrown with heather um, and other saplings. And the, the, uh, the society wanted to remove that vegetation. So we were able to help with um, removal, getting permission to remove the vegetation. Um, and we are now, through the, the great work of Maureen in particular, I've been having to suffer through me um, hitting her stuff, um, we're now in the, in the uh, process of installing an interpretation board. So, so we're trying to promote the site to visitors and to relate its rich history. It has to be said that the, the, the finds from the excavation were, um, as Chris said, rich. The board is full of rich archaeology. Um, We've done, we did some work at Coldingham again in the 2006 project, but we've not really had that many projects in the borders, have we? So I suppose one of the things we can do today is to um, put out a call for, see if we can assist anyone. Um, and before I hand over to Cara, we're going to take us across the Firth <laughs> to Dunfermline. Um, just to show you again the kind of, kind of range of stuff we've been working on. 
So this is St. Catherine's Hospice in uh, Pitton Creek Park in Dunfermline, as I said. Um, it's, it's recorded as an old almshouse related to the Dunfermline Abbey. Um, there are stories of being a poor house but then turning into a blacksmith shop. It sits right on the edge um, of the scheduled area for the Abbey and it's been, become overgrown with uh, ivy, saplings, etc. And the, there's a little slot you can see in the wall there. Um, people have been going in, um, there have been fires in there. There's even a park bench in there. I don't know quite, quite work out how they got it through that hole. Um, but, uh, so the, again, it was about opening up the, that area of the park, exploring what the, that building may or may not have been. So the, the local volunteers did a building survey, and they put up interpretation, and they've managed the vegetation. So it's very simple in that sense. Um, but it's made a, a, quite an impact on that park, and that, that part of the park was used to, I suppose you could call it antisocial behaviour, but it was also very dark, it was very overgrown. So it's kind of opened up. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's me for now. <laughs> um, job to Carol. Um, the reason I sort of giggled when we said um, Southern Scotland is because I found one map that had quite a broad uh, reach of Southern Scotland and it included Argyllshire. Um, so there is our, one Argyllshire project coming up, um, but I decided that, that we could go with that map despite uh, Google Images. Um, but this project here, I, I think the first thing that we really need to say about this project is that the group um, that we worked with make the best potato scones in Scotland and they were delivered freshly each day um, on, on site. Um, but this is Kemp's Grave, it's nine age promontory fort um, down in Dunfries and Galloway. It's quite close to Stranra. Um, and um, the site was very overgrown. Um, there had been lots of um, brash had been dumped on quite a few of the ramparts on the site. And so we worked with um, the local uh, friends of the forestry group. Um, the site is um, owned by the Woodland Trust and there's a local group that help to do um, community-based activities on site. Um, and we worked with that group to clear the vegetation on site and to have a proper look at what um, archaeological remains do survive um, on, on that site there. What was really interesting was one of our, um, ex um, our volunteers there was a horticulturalist and they were able to have a look at the more modern planting out on site and had noted that the, uh, I think it was 19th century, mm -hmm. uh, sort of part yeah. of the 19th century design landscape, um, they'd uh, planted specific trees along our lovely ramparts um, to improve the view uh, leading up to the hill force. And obviously that plays ravic on ramparts, but it looks very nice. But it was quite interesting to get that information. Um, next slide. Um, so this is the cheeky southern Scotland Argyllshire site. Um, this is a community-owned woodland um, and, uh, um, called Glendoral. And they knew that they had archaeology within their new community woodland, but they didn't really know that much about it. And they really wanted to sort of put that archaeology into context. Um, so what we did with them, we did several training workshops. Um, so we taught them how to record that archaeology. We did plane table survey, um, field survey, out on site um, and we also helped them as I say contextualize what they actually had out on site so they had a neolithic chambered cairn which to to anyone is it, it, uh, you know that particular one it just looks like a grassy mound but what we were able to do was put it into context for them to show how important it actually was to that local area um, and we also worked with them um, with on the Accord project. This was a partnership project to Dr. Monument and Archaeology Scotland did with um, Glasgow School of Arts Digital Design Studio. And that's where we did um, community-led um, digital recording of several Adopter Monument sites across Scotland. And basically, Digital Design Studio trained our volunteers to create 3D digital models of their site. And what was really interesting was they also had a cut mark stone within their woodland, um, and it was very hard to see some of the etchings on the face of the stone. And by recording it digitally, um, they just, you could suddenly see um, a lot of the features on the site, and suddenly that site became important um, to that group. Um, 
And what they've now gone on to do, they fundraise, um, they've received a pastoral um, uh, funding to improve the access to the archaeology out in their sites. They've included a lot of the archaeology sites within the path networks within their new community woodland. Um, and they're looking at further interpretation, further funding um, applications to help build upon the skills that they've developed through the Adopt a Monument scheme. So as Phil mentioned, we've also been doing what we've called um, outreach projects, and that's where we're trying to develop new heritage audiences um, throughout Scotland. So we're trying to provide projects um, for participants who perhaps never had a chance to get involved with archaeology um, before, they've never had the opportunity. And this is what, um, one such project, this was called Digging the Jimmy, um, and it was actually in central Edinburgh, and it worked with participants from Crisis, so the homeless uh, charity Crisis, and also worldwide volunteering um, who support injured servicemen and veterans. And there were two sites we were quite interested in. Um, today it's um, known as George the Fifth Park. Yeah. Yep, George the Fifth Park. Um, but we were interested in researching to see if there were any material remains of um, what was known locally as the Jimmy or the Royal Gymnasium. And this was a sort of outdoor exercise I don't want to say the word theme park because that's the, what the Daily Mail used, um, but um, it was sort of an outdoor um, park that people could go and do exercise and things like that. So we were keen to see if there were any material remains of the Jimmy, um, but also um, uh, the Jimmy got demolished and um, St Bernard's football ground got built on it. Um, St Bernard's was the third biggest football, group, uh, football team in um, Edinburgh after Hearts and Hibs, but after the war it disbanded, um, but it was very, very big um, during the interwar period. Um, so we, were, we decided to put in a couple of trenches um, uh, on the edge of this beautifully maintained park with our volunteers. And what we actually found were remains of, um, there was a Second World War army depot um, on the site. And we actually found lots of material remains associated with um, that period of use of the site, which was brilliant for our injured, um, veteran, uh, injured servicemen and veterans because they could actually start to immediately recognise the material culture um, that was so familiar to them uh, in their everyday lives. And we're still processing the finds from this site, and what's really good is a couple of our volunteers are now coming into the office and helping us with the find processing. Um, it's um, really um, Terry there, um, who's actually just coming back from the Inviticus Games, um, loves coming in and, and basically helping us sort the finds, cleaning the finds, um, sorting them into typologies, and it, it's a great help to us um, to have such um, dedicated volunteers. Um, if the streets could speak, um, this was completed by our colleague Fiona, who's not here today. Um, but this project was based in Greenock in Inverclyde. Um, and again, it was an outreach project, and it was designed to really help um, promote sort of intergenerational um, working. And so we worked with two groups, um, slightly, some slightly older volunteers, to um, start researching the streets of um, Greenock. And again, we just did lots of sort of training workshops, showing them what local resources were available to them, um, like the local museum, the local library, online resources like using PassMap, um, the fabulous array of maps on the National um, Library of Scotland website. Um, and we also went out with them to record those buildings that were important to them. Um, again, through digital um, uh, methods uh, and also through traditional recording sheets. Um, and the second audience we worked with on that project was with the um, Greenock Eye Youth Zone. And their 12 um, young participants um, decided to start researching an old post office, which is where they met every week. Um, this was a youth group basically designed to help um, young people build on career skills, do CV writing. Um, it was sort of a place to come out um, and hang out, basically. So, um, you know, but Fiona got them doing some archaeology and some recording. Um, and what's really lovely is that um, seven of the participants completed Archaeology Scotland Heritage Hero Awards. Um, there's information about that award scheme on our website. And um, five of the participants are going to come to Scotland's Community Heritage Conference to present the results of their project um, in air on the 25th of June. There's tickets available on our website. Just a quick plug there. 
And also, um, the sort of final project we wanted to talk about was Torwood Broch. Again, slightly stretching our southern Scotland um, plain. Um, but this, is, um, this project is um, just near Stirling, and it was a fantastic multi-partnered project. It was funded um, by the Forestry Commission Scotland, and it involved um, a Doctor Monument. It involved two local authority archaeologists from Falkirk and from Stirling. Um, and it involved um, 25 volunteers, um, the landowners, um, there were just so many people that came out on site to help this project. And what we did was we um, spent five days, oh, actually Jill, Jill's in the audience here, she came out and helped us. <laughs> um, so um, we spent five days clearing the vegetation on this Iron Age broch. Um, and um, we were able to then do a little bit of a condition survey to see how the broch was faring because it hadn't been looked at for quite a few years. Um, and then AOC Archaeology came along and laser scanned um, the entire site and did a topographical survey as well. And I think what's really great about this project is a really great example of how so many different stakeholders, um, so using um, governments, um, government power, people power, um, third sector people like ourselves got together on one site and worked to create an excellent data set um, of a nationally important monument. And I think it's a sort of um, template, project template that we'd really like to take forward um, during the next phase of Adopt a Monument. Yeah, so as Cara said, um, we're now looking to the future. We're, we're almost 47 projects down. Um, and we have inquiries for about 100 uh, projects, but we're always looking for more, and we're always looking to work ways we can um, help more people and more sites. And it's worth mentioning, I think the, the big underlying theme is that all of this work has been done by the people. Mm -hmm. It's all been done by the People for Archaeological Society have done two projects. We may have helped here and there, but it's their project, and they um, have been the successful people. And it's the same throughout the country. We have some projects where they've gone on to do full restorations of chapels. Well, I say full. Um, consolidation is probably the word on the restoration. And we've had projects that have done major excavations, having raised all the money themselves and managed European grants. So I think the underlying, oh yeah, as I say, the underlying story is the, it's been achieved by the people. What we have been doing, though, in a broader sense, is trying to connect different um, places and different people. So one of the plans is to to develop networks where the societies, the local groups can come together and learn from each other. Um, and one of the ways we're doing that internationally is that a project in Finland, the Tampere Museum, and a project in the Republic of Ireland, with the Heritage Council, have started to run their own adopted monument schemes. And um, one of the main benefits of that is if we can um, develop that in the right way is that we may be able to get exchanges of the volunteer groups so that people can learn and support each other in different circumstances. It's very interesting that the way the legislation works and the way the voluntary sector works in different countries. I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. Um, and yes, as Carol says, we're going to try and develop a new phase of adoption monument, so we're interested in uh, hearing what you might want to do. Thank you very much.